Thanks, Scott. And um, I'm happy to be here again this morning. So um, upcoming workshops, uh, my my two workshops in February are, are already booked, we're already full, but um, I'll be getting another one on the calendar, uh, probably in late April or May. Um, and then uh, we just announced a live workshop that Dr. Adams and I are co-facilitating in Michigan the first weekend in June. Um, so that one, when we facilitate singly, there's eight spots. When we're co-facilitating, there's 12. So um, it was it was really fun when we did it last year. It was a good energy with a larger group of guys. So I'm really excited to do that again. And then um, those of you, I don't, I don't recognize any names here that have been through workshops before, but once you've gone through the workshop, you have access to, to um, Coffee with Ken or Coffee with John, and that's a drop-in group for Enmeshed Men. Um, where uh, you you can come and share successes and struggles and you know get reoriented to some of the principles of enmeshment recovery. Um, the next one of those I'm doing is February 9th. Um, so if you've been through a workshop and want a little bit of a tune up, uh, reach out to Dr. Adams' office and uh, get on that list. Um, so our our topic today, I can't remember if I've covered this before. I know I haven't covered it in this way. If I do, we're going to talk about um, how and why to apologize. Um, as I was thinking about this, I I really think that this is the one one of the most poorly executed relationship maneuvers ever. Um, how many times have you and your partner gotten a fight that uh, looped around and around? But I apologized. I said I'm sorry. Um, what more do you want from me? Um, so some of the most aggravating fights that I think couples get in. And um, so we're, we're going to talk today about how to execute it better. And most importantly, like what you should expect, where, where you should put your focus when you're apologizing. So um, I, I think with apologies in general, we feel like it should fix more than it does and that it should fix more faster. So that can be one of the reasons why we execute poorly is um, you you may keep applying something, hoping for you know faster action when an apology, I think, is actually more of a slow acting, long release type of a thing. And we'll talk about how to sustain that long release. Um, Another thing that makes apology uh, hard to execute well is uh, it's it's completely um, it loses all of its effectiveness if you have defensiveness. So um, while it may be the right thing to say fast, it's uh, it can be really counterproductive, counter messaging to apologize when you're still defensive. Um, and I, I also wouldn't say that that means just don't apologize until you don't feel defensive. I'd say work on lowering those defenses much faster. Um, cause apology could really be, it can start opening the gates to, um, resolving a conflict in a relationship. And, um, the, the, the time frame that I give the couples that I work with is you want to be resolving your conflicts within 15 minutes. Um, because longer than 15 minutes in distress, you start to get long-term memory activation and storage, and that makes it a lot more difficult to deal with. So apologies are important to come by fast, but you've got to really thread the needle. You can't apologize defensively, or it, it, it sounds and it acts exactly the opposite. Well, I'm sorry. Like, um, oh, and I also have to say today, I'm, I'm going to sing to you all today. So um, there's a treat. <laughs> Uh, don't don't get your hopes up. <laughs> I'm I'm just hoping that the little tune will get this concept stuck in your head. Um, and uh, an another thing, and this is what we'll really talk about today, that apology is a starting point. So make sure that if you're going to use apology, that you are ready to and committed to follow through. Otherwise, you're going to hollow out the word, and you're going to make it a word that signals the start of a fight not the start of a repair. So we'll talk a little bit about that process. So um, the, the first main idea here is apology executed well can be a powerful change for the person issuing the apology. And most of the time we look at it as exactly the opposite. Me saying I'm sorry is supposed to do something big for you right now. And sometimes it does. Um, so uh, don't get me wrong, but I think that's the exception, not the rule. Um, I think apology well executed is a lot more effective at changing the mindset 
of the person giving it. Um, and, and one thing we'll talk about, we'll flesh out more here. Um, for, for the person issuing the apology, this is a transition. Think of it as a ritual that transitions us from one person thinking to two person thinking. I, I don't think there are a lot of things that people end up apologizing or need to end up apologizing for that are errors in two person thinking. Usually relationship apology is, I wasn't even thinking about our system. And that's, you know, that's why I owe you an apology. Um, so I'm gonna tell a little story about, it. this is the first big fight I remember my spouse and I having after we were married. Um, we didn't live together before we did and we'd known each other for a, about a year before we got married. So once we moved in together, we had a lot to learn. And um, so we had this tiny little apartment. It was, it was like a little, I don't know, cylinder at the bottom of, you know, somebody's house. We had a bedroom, a kitchen slash dining room and a living room and then stairs that went down to a garage. And I remember uh, we, we were in the living room and I don't remember what we were doing or even what we were fighting about, but it, it turned into a fight. And as was my nature at the time, um, I got unfair and I got nasty and my wife stormed from the living room all the way across. She went in our bedroom and she shut the door. And um, it was probably fractions of a second before I was at the door knocking and saying, I'm really sorry. Um, you know, let's work this out. And her answer from the other side of the door was, nope, it doesn't work that way. I need more time. Um, I'm sorry, he's not going to fix it. And I remember being really disoriented by that because I was thinking like, I said, I'm sorry. Like things are supposed to start getting better. And, you know, from the family that I came from, even saying I'm sorry was a huge improvement over how my family did conflict. Now, I don't remember exactly how it went, but I don't think our fight continued. I don't think I got defensive. I, I think I really heard, at least, you know, I make up that I really heard because the way that I remember this is that like, I'm not ready. It doesn't happen that fast for me really sunk into me. And so, you know, may, maybe I waited, maybe I went to the living room. I, I, I don't remember what I did. I don't even remember how we resolved it. Um, but I, I don't remember insisting that the bedroom door was open. I don't remember a fast repair. I just remember a change inside of me. Um, I ended up listening and paying attention. And I think that's the power of I'm sorry. I really felt it even if I uh, overestimated what I'm sorry could do, or I got the timing wrong, I really felt crap. This is not what I want our relationship to be about. Um, I was able to start learning from her hurt and her anger, um, which has been really, really important in handling conflict better between the two of us going forward. Um, so the overall process we're going to talk about, and I'm going to borrow from um, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Those of you with small kids, you know this show. Those of you who grew up watching Mr. Rogers, you know Daniel Tiger, the puppet. Well, he has he has a cartoon now, and um, it's for preschoolers. So we watch a lot of it at my house. Well, we used to watch more of it, but my daughter's not as obsessed with it as she used to be. But um, in each episode they have these little jingles, they have these little songs that teach really important life skills. No, no joke. You would be well served to, to go and watch if you, it, 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 it's the, it, it's, it's a better cartoon than a lot of cartoons for um, preschool kids. <laughs> you, you can stand it. Um, but you, you would do well to go and watch and refresh yourself on some of these ideas, like how to deal with anger or like taking turns. And that might sound silly, but like these are building blocks for healthy relationships. And that's, that's what Fred Rogers was all about. Um, so there's an episode about apology and here's the little song. So I'm going to sing to you first and only time. Saying I'm sorry is the first step. Then how can I help? So there's the formula we're going to look at. Um, Saying I'm sorry is only a first step. And um, it's a first step for you. Again, it's the changing from I'm in one person thinking or I'm on the war path with you to I'm turning towards you. Sorry is a recognition that you're hurting. Sorry is a recognition that I've hurt you. Sorry is a recognition that whatever was going on, I was clearly outside of two person thinking. Because even if 
it's something I totally didn't intend to do, or there was no there was no purpose and intentionality behind. I misread you in that moment, and what I said or did hurt you. It's my job to be familiar with the owner's manual on my partner and to set things up to run as well as possible for my partner, not just me. So um, the how can I help part of that little jingle, that is the attitude for the rest of the maneuver. Um, and I'm not going to outline specific steps. There are authors and researchers that outline specific set steps beyond the I'm sorry. Um, we're going to talk more about things that can happen in that principle, that attitude shift for how can I help. Um, so being able to apologize fast is helpful for a relationship. Um, Stan Tatkin calls this falling on your sword, um, which is not about martyrdom and self-sacrifice. It's about showing that we don't want to use our weapons or the, the potential weapons we have to hurt our partner. So we'll get that off the table. I'm not interested in hurting you anymore. Um, I think falling on a sword is a good uh, metaphor because I know for me, like 100% of the time I get into conflict with a spouse or someone close, um, there are things that I don't want to admit about myself. There, there's there's some pride there or there's some resentment that I'm having a hard time owning as mine. So it will come out as, well, you always do this. So, you know, I'm pissed at you for good reason. Um, the truth is you're wrong. Partner's wrong. Um, you're wrong about how to handle your partner. Um, everybody runs into that in their relationships. Um, so I'm sorry is a recognition that I was outside that two person thinking, I got you wrong. I got us wrong. Um, everyone needs to apologize. Um, no matter what the overall relationship score is. So I see this a lot with couples I work with post betrayal is in, in discrete instances. And I understand why this happens. Um, there, there's a lot of, uh, compassion there's a lot of empathy for why couples go down this way but but you, you've got to you've got to think bigger no matter who hurt who in a big way in a betrayal no matter what the overall relationship score is who can trust who um, apology is a basic human relationship skill and if you are going to take that off the table for yourself or your partner at any point you're playing with fire it's such a basic relationship skill that um you know, PBS feels the need to teach this skill to preschoolers. That should tell us something about how important this is. So um, it's a it's a basic tenet of secure functioning that we are able to appropriately respond to our partner's distress and to do that quickly. So this is not, I'm sorry, is not turning the tables and saying, I don't have a leg to stand on, I'm wrong about everything. No, 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 it's in this moment. I've contributed either through my action or my inaction, my wrong attention or my neglect. I've contributed to something that hurts you. And I'm trying to turn a corner away from my carelessness into back into it's important to me how you feel. It's important to me that um, you're not in distress in our relationship. So um, be careful not to hold your sorries hostage or to make them conditional. If you're doing that, then you are the problem. Yeah, I could apologize here, but you, you know, have done years and years of this, or I could apologize here, but you hurt me first. So until you apologize, I'm not doing it. Um, that's, uh, that's playground stuff. Um, I, I would assume that most of the people watching this are not, you know, children or teenagers. It's not developmentally appropriate, I would say, for an adult to say, I'll follow the rules if you do. Um, in secure functioning, um, it's, it's really essential that we lead with secure functioning, whether or not we think the other side is going to do that. Otherwise, you, you get this stalemate, you get this standoff. So um, in delivering the apology, I'll just draw your attention again to defensive explaining is a huge culprit in undermining an apology. Um, remember, saying I'm sorry is the first step and then you move to the attitude, how can I help? So if I'm sorry is not followed by your capacity to say how can I help you, 
you're only going to get defensive and you're going to make it all about, well, I said this, so why don't you feel better? When, when I say apology is more of a, a slow release, um, th th think about when your partner hurts you or they undermine your trust, especially in the situation that folks who tune into this webinar are in, neither of you are up for a really fast, okay, all's forgiven, like, I trust you again. No, <laughs> like, that's not where you guys are at. So what, what you want to see long term is when there is hurt or when there's rupture, are we interested in turning back towards each other? And, and sometimes the quality of that turning back, we don't trust immediately. So we have to watch it. So the first person giving the apology, holding that space, how can I help? I'm here to help. That's so, so important in the follow through. It's like, you know, tennis or golf. Making contact with the ball is only the first half of the swing. And your follow through makes all the difference. Um, same same thing with apology. Um, a lot of people. Uh, so so the how can I help? Uh, so sorry. Let me back up. Um, saying I'm sorry has to be genuine. Remember, it's for you. It's not a magic word that fixes your partner or makes him feel better. It's your turning back towards the relationship. I was thinking in a one person way, and that hurt you. I'm back here thinking about uh, two person. How can I help you? You're hurting. And here, here's the other thing about I'm sorry. Once your partner's hurting, it doesn't matter whether you caused it or not. It doesn't matter whether you think you caused it or not. Because saying I'm sorry is the first step. The most important thing is how can I help? Do you really care? Like, are you really going to withhold your help if somebody else hurt your partner or your partner hurt themselves? Are you going to withhold your help from that? Um, now the, how can I help is also, it's not just a blank check for your partner. It's also you asking, no, no, no. How can I help? Because there may be things that your partner asks for immediately that you can't do either functionally or ethically or, you know, whatever. So it's not just, how can I help is not just putting the burden on your partner's lap saying, tell me what to do next. That actually turns off the thinking problem solving part of our brain. And that gets us waiting for instruction. Um, so you need to be thinking about also, what can I do? What am I willing to do here? So um, in the, the follow-up then, the how can I help? A lot of people have a problem solving problems because they don't really understand the nature of the problem in the first place. We're more attuned to this feels bad. I want to feel less of this. How do I get away? And you know, it, it's a real skill set um it, it's a real difficult thing to learn how to tolerate the discomfort of watching something closely that doesn't feel good so that you can understand it better um so you have to be willing to you know one one thing that could be helpful after the i'm sorry is be willing to ask some follow-up questions and to hear feedback um don't cut straight to what should i have done even i would even say in an apology don't go there to what should I have done? Because I see couples get all the time caught in the way we're going to resolve things is I'm going to, you are going to understand what you should have done. And th that does two things. First of all, it enshrines perfectionism in the relationship, which is a breeding ground for shame. Um, the other thing that it does is um, it doesn't really deal with feelings. It, it gets us thinking about these feelings are a problem. So how do we create a relationship where we don't have to deal with these feelings? Sorry, hurt, hurt feelings are part of the human experience. Hurting the people that you love, uh, mismanaging them is part of the human experience. You can't plan that out of your relationship. And if you try to do that, you're going to you're gonna create a tightrope that you and your partner can live on rather than a comfortable home. Um, so don't even think about what should I have done um, that also getting that, like, okay, what, what do you want? Or what should I have done? Just asking for that. And even getting that, if, if you're the partner being asked that don't fall into that trap because it turns off the attention brain. It just, you know, I'm an automaton, I'm following orders here. That also builds resentment. Um, you can say things like, I can see that I hurt you and then make your best guess, make your best guess at why that is hurtful. I can see that I hurt you. I I know that I've 
said I wouldn't do this a lot, or I, I, I know you've told me that this hurts you. And every time I forget, you know, it, it hurts extra. Um, if you do this with sincerity, you'll be ready to listen if your partner has additional information or a correction. No, it's not about you said you would do this again. It's like, this is the way that my mom would make me feel or my dad would make me feel. So notice there, this isn't about getting the answer right. It's about opening your heart so that you can actually understand what's going on with your partner in that moment. Um, which is what two-person functioning is all about, is we stay present with each other. We stay in the present with each other. We don't run this relationship off of past scripts and herds, although those come in all the time. Um, we orient to what's going on presently. Um, or if your partner doesn't have a correction, you're getting it right, you'll be able to see your partner acknowledging that you got it right and that you understand. And that's where apology starts to help the person that you've hurt. I feel like you're understanding. I feel like you get it. Um, and whether or not that equates to, so you won't do it again in the long term, who knows, but in the moment, what that equates to is, okay, now you see me. Now you're here. That's where co-regulation starts. That's what brings the partner down, not I'm sorry. It's knowing why you're sorry and being able to communicate that in a, in a connecting way and have your partner say, oh, I recognize. I recognize that you recognize. Um, <clears throat> after some understanding is established, again, as the person apologizing, um, take some more guesses. Would it help you if I... Um, this is not the same as telling as your partner telling you what you have to do or you telling your partner, here's what I'm willing to do. Again, there's this soft, curious, we're holding a tender, broken heart here. Would it help if I, so I'm thinking about that fight with my spouse when we were first married. Would it help if I gave you some space? Um, what I was offering, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as fine-tuned as this, but what I was offering, would it help if you opened the door and we talked about it? That's what I offered first. And she said, hell no, <laughs> it would not help if we opened the door and talked about it. And be, because the apology was genuine for me, I could hear that. And so I'm pretty sure I didn't get in the car and leave. That's not really my style. And the apartment wasn't big enough to go and get lost somewhere. So I think I went and sat on the couch until she opened the door. And the way the apartment was laid out, she could, as soon as she opened the door, she could look and she could see that I was there. Would it help if I stayed around so that when you're ready to talk, we can talk? Um, so remember, we're misusing an apology when we expect it to be a quick fix. So again, part of getting better at apology is being able to tolerate your partner's distress and pain and maybe even anger at you. Because maybe there really isn't anything that makes that go away fast. There are certain emotions that once we start experiencing them, once we go over, you know, the critical mass, like we just kind of have to process through it. There's not a quick fix. So, so part of your journey to getting better at apology is, is being able to take deep breaths in the face of your partner's disappointment or anger or hurt so that you don't run away from it or try to shut it down or make them feel a different way that you can be there with them. Um, apology is for you. It's a ritual for you as the apologizer that moves you from one person to two person thinking. Sometimes your partner immediately benefits. Um, I would say that's the exception of the rule. A lot of times they don't immediately benefit. So remember, saying I'm sorry is the first step. Then how can I help? And that's that's the follow through. The how can I help is the follow through. And you stay there until your partner is helped by you. So that is how and why to apologize. I have to admit, I am spinning. Uh, we've not done this topic before. And wow. Um, I have lots of little notes here. I see we've got some questions in the Q&A. Go ahead and type questions in, in the, into the Q&A. But I, I do have some questions for you. Number one, will you sing the song one more time, please? <laughs> <laughs> please, please, <Okay>. please. <laughs> OK, um, I'll sing it. But you will get the full effect. Because at the end of every Daniel Tiger episode, the little, the little jingle is in a bigger song that really gives it texture and 
um, you know, meaning. So the jingle is saying I'm sorry is the first step. Then how can I help? There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think it's the second step that is almost always missing. Uh, maybe not almost always, but in my world, you know, almost always I can remember as a little kid, you know, apologize to so-and-so, you know, the forced apology. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm not sorry. You're not sorry. We're not sorry. Um, you know, the forced apologies. And, I, and let me just ask about that because I think in adult relationships, a lot of people feel forced into an apology. And can you comment on that and, and how to get out of that habit or that Yeah, space? yeah. Again, I, I think the forced apology comes from a misunderstanding and an absolute myth over how feelings work. So I, I, I do think it's good to learn how to recognize quickly and change our mind quickly when we've hurt somebody. Um, but the feelings of shame that we have of the, as the person who's done the hurting and the feelings of pain and maybe shame and anger that we have as the person who's been hurt, like, again, those, those take time. Um, so one, one way I would say of getting out of that forced apology feeling is stop thinking it's supposed to fix it fast. It's, it's, yeah. it's a reorientation for you. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to stop doing my really hurtful one person thinking thing. And I'm, I'm ready to get thinking about us and you again. Um, and, you know, due, due to the nature of your, your hurt, sometimes your partner might need a really, really long time to watch for that sincerity and that, that consistency. In, in other words, that do you really mean it? is not saying, do you mean the words that you say? It's do your actions support what you're saying? I'm sorry, that brings me sorrow. Your sorrow is not, you know, it's, that, that's, that's not where I want you to be. I'm gonna help you um, get out of that. Yeah, I mean, when, when I work with people on doing amends, um, you know, I, the first thing I, I want them to understand is I'm sorry is not enough. <laughs> you know, it is about, this is what I did. Here is how I think I hurt you. You know, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to behave differently in the future. I'd like to make things right. You know, it's how can I help? And everybody always thinks in amends, I'm sorry that I stole $500 from you when I was, you know, working for you. Okay, now pay the money back with interest. <laughs> Let them know that you're never going to do this again. And, you know, um, have some actions. How can I help? How can I make it right? Um, and that's that's often what's missing. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you about the non-apology apology. I'm so sorry you're upset. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this this is where I think you 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 have to stop thinking about apology in terms of the person you're giving it to, and you have to think about yourself, which is counterintuitive. So the I, I'm sorry that you're upset. It's it's blaming the person who's upset for being upset. Well, it's it's the focus it's the focus on the other person. Like, sure, I'm sorry that you're upset, but what does that have to do with me? And that's what apology is really about, is you, as the person giving the apology, you are working hard to figure out, you're showing your commitment to figure out what exactly is my part in this. And I'm, I'm sorry, apologies aren't warranted for someone who witnesses hurt happening. You know, that, that's the sympathetic apology, which has its place. Like if you watch someone fall down or skin their knee or like lose their job, I'm so sorry, that sucks that that happened. But we're not talking about that kind of apology. We're talking about, I was a part of this. And so until your focus can be on you and how you feel about what you've done and um, your recognition that I have to radically change how I was thinking because how I was thinking allowed me to hurt you in this way. I have to radically change that or we can't ever be okay. Um, you know, in that, in that, way of, of thinking that way of looking at it i'm sorry you feel is never an apology because that's not even it's not even on point with the principle yeah yeah and i mean 
you know, I, I just, I come from a family system where apologies were either do it or else, or they were, gosh, I'm sorry you're upset, but there must be something wrong with you because, uh -huh. you know, because you're upset. I mean, I'm sorry you feel that way, but, you know, I'm sure as hell not going to change. Or it was manipulative. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I'll tell you I'm sorry, but now you have to be nice to me again. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was very conditional and manipulative, which you talked about. And when you sent me spinning was when you said an apology is meant to change the mindset of the apologizer. Mm. And I, I, I'm almost in tears right now. Mm. I mean, I never thought about it that way. I never, I don't know that I've ever received an apology from anyone Yeah, that was that genuine. Yeah. Um, that, that makes me think, to Scott, like that brings up a lot of emotion for me when you put it in terms of, I don't know that I've ever gotten a lot of that. Yeah. I think that's where apology can be something that for a lot of relationships, it's like a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Stan Tatkin will say apology is cheap, not meaning it's useless, but it doesn't yeah. it cost the person giving it a lot. Right. I think in the end, the follow through should cost the person giving it. It's not a throwaway phrase. It is right. something so valuable yeah i'm sorry i did this and and how can i help i mean it's just step two is the i'm <laughs> you have messed with my mind i will be thinking about this later let's mm -hmm. jump into the questions this is not yeah. all about me <laughs> but i i just i wanted you to know how powerful that was for me um Okay, question. What happens to the people? What happens when the people you've hurt refuse to even talk with you? This is going on now for two months after the incident. And then there's a follow up. Um, I hurt my wife and her adult daughter. They resist my apology, citing self care. Yeah. So re remember, apology is not a ritual for two people, it's a ritual for one. Um, so in that space, and this is, you know, not on the same uh, scale as this, but that story I told about the fight with my wife in that space of no contact, not opening the door or saying, I'm sorry, that's not how it works. I need more time. Um, the sincerity of the apologizing for me put me in the direction of thinking about her. What exactly was it that I did or said that was so hurtful for her? Um am I understanding the scope of this? If I'm sitting there scratching my head saying, why don't you, it's been two months. There's two possibilities. Either that person's crazy or I am not anywhere near in touch with the amount of damage that I caused. I'm minimizing. And I would say, if you're in the attitude of apology, you don't take option one saying, well, you're, you're crazy. You, you look at option two, which is what am I not getting here? What do I not see about this? And for, for a lot of people who betray, um, that's what a lot of after you get stable in early recovery is all about, is wrapping your mind around just exactly, you know, what did I do? Why was it a big deal? Um, if your system's reacting as if it's a big deal, you at least have to consider that it's a big deal. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm I'm still in my own stuff. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I just, I said, uh, I've never received that type of apology. I also don't think I've ever given that type of apology. And yeah. um, that's quite the revelation, um, which I kind of wonder if that's, that's what's going on in, in this, in this question is, you know, am I, and I think that's what you just said. Am I really thinking about how these, these other people are feeling? And if I was in their position, I might need this much space as well. I mean, how can, so let me ask you the follow-up, which is how can he approach them say, to say, I'm, I'm, I want to apologize. I want to make amends. I want to behave differently. I want to make things right. You know, the second step, 
how can he approach it to, to let them know he's ready to do that when they're if and when they're ready to receive it? First of all, come back with more than you had the first time. So if the first time is I've been thinking about this um, or I can see that you're upset, like c- coming back with and, I, and I, I'm, I'm making some assumptions based on what this group is normally made of. Um, I'm in therapy. I'm looking at what I did and why I did it and what that's about for me. Um, I'm working to understand and empathize with your feelings. And again, that's not this automatic, like I'm showing, hey, I paid the price. Now you have to open up because the the truth about hurt is we, we never know where our partner's breaking point is. And we can't be the ones who define that. So, so sometimes the how can I help, if you ask that to a partner, they may say, well, how you can help is you can go get well. You can go work on yourself. Um, you, you can take a look at the part of you that felt like what you were doing was okay and never ever questioned this. Now that can feel really distracting or dissatisfying if, if the help we wanna give is fixing your broken heart um, or making you feel better. Right. Um, but again, apology is a mu- it's a much deeper, it has a potential to be a much deeper thing than just, I recognize I was out of bounds. Let me take three steps to the left. So I'm back in balance. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you mentioned, you used the words feel better. And I was thinking, you know, my version of how can I help is how can I manipulate you into feeling better? Yeah. And yeah. this is not what you're talking about. No, it's like, like I said, apology is a slow release thing. So if you're getting fast acting relief, I mean, count yourself lucky, but don't stop there. Yeah. Um, if, if saying I'm sorry gives, gives your partner or the other person some hope and brings down some defenses, awesome, you can get to work faster, but there's still that like, the, the apology part is not the work. I think that's another reason why Stan Tadkin says it's cheap. <laughs> like saying I'm sorry is not hard. Yeah. That how can I help and actually being helpful, that is super hard because there's a lot of like, I really have to wrap my mind around what this is or I don't know how to help. And sometimes the ways that are identified that I can help. So I'm, I'm thinking about like the enmeshed folks that I work with and the the ways that they have put their partner and their family of creation second to their family of origin very often the how can i help is you can restructure your relationship and your commitment to your family of origin so that you don't deprioritize us we need to be number one gosh that's really hard help to give because for the vast majority of mesh guys i work with they don't hate their mothers and their family they love them but that love is a burden, not a wonderful thing that people share. And, you know, unhooking from that burden to help is hard. Very, very hard. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, Can you speak to how self-sabotage shows up for both addicts and betrayed partners? That's a big question. Um, um, this is... Um, question from a betrayed partner who's been on this journey for three years they've done full therapeutic disclosure the whole process uh, extensive individual trauma hearing 12 steps and in couples therapy for six months Uh, my protective parts of anger resentment and criticism will show up and block me how do i not let self-sabotage get in the way of the closeness i want from someone when i know that person is capable of hurting me so deeply or doing so i mean that's uh, there's a lot there john thoughts no that that last part that last part is the key there do i listen to this part of me um you have to look at two things so so self-sabotage is only sabotage if it's keeping you from something that is really really good for you so if that's happening you have issues of shame to work on you have issues of worthiness to work on you have fear of vulnerability to work on and um, the only cure for any of those, as as you know, Brene Brown has has outlined, is to face them. Shame must be talked about. Um, feelings of worthlessness have to be explored, not just avoided. Um, the other side of this, which I I 
you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the way you're thinking about this is this could be a part of me that is putting on the brakes because the conscious part of me is saying, no, 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 this is good. And there's something deep down inside me that knows it's not. So you have to look at it a couple of ways. Like, for, first of all, the like, if, if, and again, you identify these protective parts of anger, resentment, and criticism, um, you have to look at the damage you're willing to sustain if you stop protecting yourself that way. So like, what's the worst that could happen? You know, for me, it's, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about with my spouse, if I let those things down, the worst that can happen is I can hear disappointment. I can hear anger from my partner, um, which hurts. Um, if the worst that could happen is something like, then I could smack me across the room or he could uh, take these things that I told him in confidence and use them as weapons. Like that's a dangerous relationship. Um, so you have to look at, you have to look at the risk and your, your ability or your, your, your capacity to um, take that risk. Um, and then I think the other part that you have to look at is uh, th this is why I think activating ourselves, my men's group was just talking about this last night, how important it is to show up authentically because you don't know what's safe for you or good for you if you are not you. So you really have to look at the, is this a wiser part of me? Is have I been showing up authentically? And when I do, what's the feedback I get? I told a story of, of um, you know, in our, our church congregation in our, our neighborhood we moved into about eight years ago. Um, it's one of the loneliest times in my life, like really disconnected from friends and, you know, things like that. So, you know, I came in really desperate and, I led with a ton of vulnerability, which is really what I believe in. Um, but it's not like that was just rewarded with sunshine and lollipops and good friends. Like it was, it was hard. And I remember making a comment once about my own recovery and 12 steps. And the comment immediately after that was, yeah, this isn't 12 steps. Don't turn it into that. And I was, you know, dagger to the heart. Um, but the thing I learned, and I was I was telling my men's group this last night, the guy who said that I actually go to hockey games with him a couple of times a year. Like, and it's not just a big group that he happens to be there. Like he invites me and I accept from him. Um, showing up as myself there, one of the things that showed me is he doesn't hold that. He doesn't do emotion like that. So when we sit at the hockey games, we talk about, I don't know, what temperature do you think the Zamboni has to be to melt the ice? How much money do you think an event like this pulls in? Like, it is the most inane, like, but when I need a night to turn off my brain and, like, not do any feelings, that's exactly the kind of person that I want to hang out with because I don't have to do that. So, so that self-activation and being authentically ourselves, while it does open us up to hurt, it also opens up the window for us to see things clearly. And so that's that's something you have to look at in these relationships too. Have I been authentic and have I been myself? And if so, am I shutting down for good reason? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it or, strikes me that the anger and the resentfulness and the criticalness are authentic and they're information. I mean, yeah. I always look at feelings as neither right or wrong. They're information. Why yeah. am I having these feelings? And I might be having them because I need to protect myself, or I might be having them because I'm still angry about what happened a year ago that's not relevant today. Yeah. But yeah. And that that would be, I, I think, I think one of the cruxes there would be um with the anger and resentment and criticism I've have, I've been feeling, has that come out of my authentic right. interaction here? Or is that coming, is that preempting? my authentic interaction is that preventing me yeah. from being authentic here yeah okay let's let's go to the next one here uh, background uh, my husband is a porn addict who claims sobriety for the past six months um he is attending individual therapy twice a month and we are attending couples therapy with a csat twice a month um he has tried 12 step and had a sponsor but has dropped both he says they don't work for him he has no support system besides me and his therapist. 
two questions. One, can he, he get and stay in recovery without the 12 steps? Two, how do I react in a healthy ways, in a healthy way if he continues to refuse to reach out? Okay. So the answer to the first question is simply yes, but I would say, um, so in AA, I, I think this comes from AA. This is a program you will do by yourself, but you won't do alone. Um, good news is there are more than just 12 step groups out there to support addicts in recovery. There's smart recovery. There's refuge recovery. Um, there's, what do they call it? Is it life ring? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of different approaches to peer support in, in recovery. And it's, it's the peer support that I think is the critical element. You know, even a therapy group. Yes. It doesn't have to be 12 steps, but I, I don't know how you get at the shame that addicts live in if you don't ever talk to people about it. And your therapist is it so so my men's group was talking about this last night too. They were expressing the affection and the love that they have for each other. And um in that group, I'm largely on the outside of that because I play a different role there. You know, I have relationships with those men, but they are not the same relationships that they're forming with each other. My relationships with them is not as vulnerable because my relationship with them is largely one way. I know a lot about them and they don't know a lot about me. Um, we focus a lot on their feelings. We don't focus on my feelings and that's the way that it should be. So that 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 one-to-one, -one, I, I think that's necessary, not, not that one-to-one, -one, that group experience, talking with other people who are in your position is absolutely necessary um, for cleaning out all the shame corners and um, for, for getting a chance at, uh, you know, and, and I'll, I'll say to those guys in that group all the time, um, this is a place for you to, to practice authenticity and to feel authenticity because it's too high stakes to do that in your marriage right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, so some kind of program being, and, and what the program is, is it gives something the group to work on to distract them from the fact that we're building bonds with other people. <laughs> That's the important thing is bonds with peers. Um, and then can, the second, can I, can I jump in before you do the second? Yeah. Um, I could not get sober without group support and I could not, and I would not stay sober without it. Um, it can be 12 steps. It can be a men's group at church, uh, therapy groups, particularly for sex and porn addiction are great. Um, we have an online work group for porn addicts. I highly recommend that you point him toward that. I would love to see him in the group. I teach it. He would meet other specifically porn addicts who are working on the same problems he is. Um, you know, I love your answer. Yes, but, <laughs> you know, you can do it without 12 steps, but you'd better find a supportive community of other addicts who, who are going through the same thing you're going through. Otherwise, your shame won't be you alive. Um, and that's the truth. Yeah, yeah, very well said. Uh, my friend, my friend Carver Brown puts it this way. Um, if, if you don't really get into recovery, um, and, and he talks about people in 12 step groups who've been there for 20 years, who aren't really in recovery, he says, the, these are the weird crusty guys that when it comes time for a group conscience meeting, which is when the group talks about how they're working, these are the guys who want to talk about the, um, proper direction to pass the, the donation basket at the end of the group. Like, are we going to have Sanka or real coffee? You know? Yeah, you're missing the whole point, man. If that's if that's your big concern, like there there has not been recovery that has penetrated you, and uh, it needs it needs to do that. So the the second question, how do I react in a healthy way? The first thing that stands out to me is, you know, he says they don't work for him. Um, Curiosity is healthy. So you could ask, what not what's not working, but what aren't you getting that you feel like you need. Because do doesn't work assumes that there is like, here's here's what working would be like. That's why I can tell this isn't working. Okay, so what 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 is not happening for you? Not what is not working. Um, so curiosity, I think, is always healthy. Um, boundaries are healthy. Remember, boundaries are not to control. The most basic form of a boundary is stating your feelings. I'm very, very concerned 
In fact, I don't feel stable. I, I don't feel confident in your recovery plan that does not include some kind of peer support, some kind of group work. Um, all the experts are telling me that's important. And uh, I'm sorry, but when it comes to recovering from addiction, I'm going to trust an expert over your six months of experience. Um, so boundaries are healthy. Um, I, I also think that so sometimes it gets to a point. Uh, right, another one would be um, for you to, again, this is in the, the, the spirit of boundaries, outline what your concerns are. I'm continuing to see X, Y, Z. And I think some group work would help you with that. Point being, if you can get my concerns addressed, like, you know, you're not very empathetic or you're not accountable. If you can address those without the help of a group and that part of our relationship starts working better for me and I have less concerns, I don't mean to be flipping with this, but I may not care how you came across being able to do that if you can do it. So another healthy response is, here's specifically what's going on for me that I think group would help you with, or I've been told, or I'm hopeful group would help you with. So, so keep it. And this, this, I think was the last webinar that I did. And, and one of the things I suggested was um, focus on the concerns, not the diagnosis. Well, you're an addict, so you should be in group. No, you, you, you can't talk about your feelings with me or anybody. And that's a huge missing piece for me in our relationship. I think being in a group, developing some trust and relationships with other people would help you be able to talk about your feelings. And again, if you can figure out how to do that without that, more power to you, as long as at the end of the day, I end up having a partner who can share feelings with me. Um, good stuff today. Um... I will get this posted as soon as I can possibly get it posted and I will be listening to it again. Um, thank you, John, for a great topic and for uh, causing my brain to explode. And that's just fine. Apparently it needed to explode. Um, I hope everybody else got as much out of this as I did. Um, thank you for your great questions and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Anything you want to say to take us out, John? Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the great questions. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody in a couple of weeks. And thank you for singing twice <laughs> I'll, I'll try to do that more unless we get feedback that i should not which i hope to as well <laughs> yeah. all right thanks everybody have a, have a good have a good day and a good weekend